Good morning, Bristol communities, and welcome to our literary webinar. We're so excited today to have one of Long Island's most well-known authors, Ellen Meester. She has, Meister, I'm sorry. She has a PowerPoint ready for us, and um, then we can open it up for some Q&A, so to you. Great, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Okay, we gotta get the PowerPoint up and running here. Are we good? Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks to Hofstra, thanks to Bristol. Um, uh, as Maggie said, I'm Ellen Meister. I'm the author of uh, four novels, including uh, Farewell, Dorothy Parker, and um, yeah, and The Other Life. Uh, so I'm just gonna get right into the presentation because I'm gonna talk to you a bit today about the Algonquin Roundtable, about forging literary friendships, uh, and about how that translates to today's world. So. Okay, you probably know a bit about the Algonquin Roundtable already, but I'm just going to go over a few things with you here. Now, in 1919, there was a theater critic named Alexander Wolcott who started inviting his friends to lunch at the Algonquin Hotel in New York City. Um, the writers enjoyed each other's company so much that it became an ongoing luncheon for 10 whole years. In fact, it was often called the 10-year lunch. So the group met to uh, engage in wordplay and, and witticisms, and interestingly, they initially called themselves the Vicious Circle, but that didn't stick, and the Algonquin Roundtable actually did. So now I just want to go through with you quickly who the uh, main members of the Algonquin Roundtable were. So if you look at the PowerPoint, you'll see um, this is, of course, a famous cartoon by Al Hirschfeld. And the person that's highlighted there is uh, Robert Sherwood. So he's, um, he was an author and a playwright. We also had George S. Kaufman, who was also a playwright. And you might know that name. He collaborated on many of the Marx Brothers films. That's Edna Ferber, a, uh, a novelist, and um, you probably know her as the author of Showboat. Uh, the next gentleman you see there is Franklin Pierce Adams. He was a newspaper columnist and largely responsible for making the Algonquin Roundtable so popular because he quoted many of the members in his daily column. Uh, next to him is playwright Mark Connolly. Uh, next to him is Haywood Brune. At the time, he was probably the most successful and popular writer at the Algonquin Roundtable. Um, then we have Alexander Wolcott, who I've mentioned already. Next to him is Robert Sherwood. And then there's Dorothy Parker. Um, I'm sorry, I said Robert Sherwood, that was Robert Benchley. And next to Robert Benchley is Dorothy Parker, who was a critic a poet, a short story writer, and a screenwriter. Now, um, there are a couple of other people who were part of the main group who weren't pictured in Al Hirschfeld's famous cartoon, and those are Ruth Hale, Harold Ross. Ruth Hale was, a, uh, was an early feminist um, and a writer. Harold Ross, who went on to found a little magazine called The New Yorker. And John Peter Toohey, who was a publicist and really one of the people responsible for starting the Algonquin Roundtable. Um, you might have heard of some of the um, occasional members, too. Tallulah Bankhead, the actress. Uh, Jane Grant, who was um, an editor and a playwright. Beatrice Kaufman, married to George S. Kaufman, also a writer. Nasa McMain, who was an artist. Uh, Harpo Marx, who I think needs no explanation. And Deems Taylor, who was a composer. And there were also many more people who were in and out of the round table over the years. So, you know, in addition to the daily luncheon, the group worked and worked with one another and played together constantly, and a lot of collaborations grew out of this um, association. So, one of the ones I wanted to talk to you about was the startup of a tiny, tiny magazine that was the brainchild of um, Harold Ross and his wife, Jane Grant. And that was called The New Yorker. Now, when he first started it up, it was in a very, very tiny office with an even tinier budget. And he did hire some of his Algonquin friends to be his early writers. One of these was Dorothy Parker, who might not have been the best employee to choose, even though she was brilliantly talented. Um, she wasn't the best worker. And one day when he was... Uh, um, out in the middle of the day and ran into Mrs. Parker in a speakeasy and he asked her why she wasn't at work. She said, someone was using the pencil. So that's one of the witticisms that Dorothy Parker is known for. 
So I want to go over with you some of the other famous lines from the members of the Algonquin Round Table. Um, Alexander Wolcott was famous for saying, all the things I really like to do are either immoral, illegal, or fattening. Robert Benchley was the one who actually coined that wonderful line, why don't you get out of that wet coat and into a dry martini? Um, he also is famous for uh, a line he said after he and Dorothy Parker had left their jobs at Vanity Fair magazine, they worked together renting a very, 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 very tiny closet-sized office in Manhattan, and Robert Benchley had said um, one cubic foot less of space and it would have constituted adultery. So, Franklin Pierce Adams had said, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad old memory. Um, and then also, there was a time when he was with Alexander Wolcott, who uh, somebody approached and asked them to sign a copy of a book he had written called uh, Shouts and Murmurs. And Wolcott, who was kind of full of himself, said, ah, what is so rare as a Wolcott first edition? To which Franklin Pierce Adams said, a Wilcott second edition. Um, so, uh, this is one of my favorite ones. So another person that was popular at the Algonquin Round Table was a playwright named Mark Connolly. And one time a man came over and rubbed Mark Connolly's bald pate and said, you know Mark, your head feels as smooth as my wife's behind. And without missing a beat, Connolly felt his own scalp and replied, so it does. So, Dorothy Parker um, is famous for when hearing that Calvin Coolidge had died. She said, how can they tell? And here is George S. Kaufman, who had said, I like terra firma. The more firma, the less terra. Um, also, another great George S. Kaufman line. You know, he was a, a newspaper man for many years. And when a press agent asked him, how do I get my leading lady's name into your newspaper? He replied, shoot her. So, okay, uh, Robert Sherwood is famous for having said uh, when he was reviewing Cowboy Tom Mix, they say he rides as if he's part of the horse, but they don't say which part. And Edna Ferber got off a great line on Noel Coward. Um, she was wearing a tailored suit and he said to her, you look almost like a man, to which Edna Ferber replied, so do you. So as you can see, the Ugonquin Roundtable, they were a pretty cutting group. Um, and, you know, this lunch, like I said, continued to meet for 10 full years. Now, one of the reasons that it's sustained for so long is because writing can be a very, very lonely profession. You know, you sit for hours and hours and days and days in front of your computer or with no one but yourself. Um, so the need for, you know, human company is quite profound. Speaking personally, I started getting serious about my writing about 13 years ago, and I didn't know any other writers at the time, and I really felt like I was in a vacuum. Um, I had no way of knowing if other writers were experiencing the same difficulties and the same struggles as I was, and I was really desperate for companionship, for some kind of connection to other writers. Um, so I did what any um, uh, modern woman would do, and I took to the internet. Now, at that time, there was no Facebook and there was no Twitter. There wasn't really any social media. So it was difficult to find other writers. But I was determined, and eventually I located a forum uh, where I met another woman who was working on a novel, and we became fast friends and critique pals. We exchanged um, uh, chapters with one another and helped each other's writing along. Now, soon after that, I discovered a wonderful website called zoetrope.com. Now that was the brainchild of a filmmaker, Francis Ford Coppola. And it was a place for novelists, short story writers, screenwriters, and poets to gather online. It served as much the same function as the Algonquin Roundtable. We connected, we made friends, uh, we traded barbs, we enjoyed each other's company. We also critiqued each other's work and learned quite a lot. Um, now, over the years, uh, bigger social media sites have burst onto the scene, and Zoe Trope is actually a shell of its former self. But more writers than ever are connecting online. It's hard to gauge exactly how many of us there are, 
but I can give you a few numbers that are going to give you some indication of how absolutely massive this community is. So now, if you take a look at Twitter, you can just sort of gauge by looking at different Twitter accounts and seeing how many followers they have. The Authors Guild, for instance, which I belong to and many published authors uh, belong to, has 8,600 followers. A, uh, a site called writing.com has 14,000 followers. Um, a, a very popular literary agent who tweets about the business has 22,000 followers. There's a site called Daily Writing Tips. 29,000 writers follow that. Poets and Writers Magazine has over 67,000 people following them. Now there's a, there's a site called NaNoWriMo. Now that stands for National Novel Writing Month and I just want to explain a little bit about what that is. This is an organization that challenges writers to do as much writing in one month as they possibly can. So every November, writers sign up to see if they can possibly write 50,000 words in one month. That's not quite the length of a full novel, but it's getting pretty close. Um, so you have to be a really quick writer and a really dedicated writer and have to do pretty much nothing else for the month of November to write. And you think that's a pretty tall order to get 50,000 words, almost a whole novel written in a month. But um, 94,000 people follow them on Twitter. And uh, a very popular um, publishing executive, a publishing guru, if you will, named Jane Friedman, 185,000 people follow her, mostly writers. And Writer's Digest has almost half a million followers. So as you can see, the online writing community is absolutely massive. Now, I told you a minute ago about um, NaNoWriMo, and you might be thinking, you know, okay, so they have 94,000 people, but how many actually rise to the challenge of trying to write 50,000 words in one month? Well, last year, over 300,000 people signed up. So it's a really um, huge community. Now, Personally, I've never signed up for NaNoWriMo. I'm not a particularly fast writer. I have enough trouble finishing a novel in one year. Two years is, more, is a more comfortable pace for me. But I do want to talk to you about writing and one, particularly, uh, one particular member of the Algonquin Roundtable who inspired my most recent novel, which is Farewell, Dorothy Parker. Um, it's interesting for me to bring that up today because it's kind of an auspicious day for me because it came out in paperback today. And if I can, I'll, I'll show the different covers. It came out in hardcover back in, um, back in February. And today it comes out with a brand new cover in paperback. And that's always an exciting day for an author because when a book comes out in paperback, it means it's available to more people. Um, and we always like to reach as many people as we can. You know, that's sort of the whole point of it. We like to connect, we like to get readers. But I do want to talk to you about what inspired this book because I have a lifelong love of Dorothy Parker. You know, I've been a fan of her since I was a teenager and I first discovered her astounding poetry, her brilliant witticisms, and I came to understand her very intense understanding of the human heart as well as her snarky reviews um, and so much more. Uh, now, you know, it's hard not to love a, a writer who says things like, when asked what her favorite words in the English language are, she said, the ones I like are check and enclosed. She's also famous for saying, don't look at me in that tone of voice. One of my favorites, you can't teach an old dogma new tricks. And the first thing I do in the morning is brush my teeth and sharpen my tongue. So now, you might think, as a lifelong fan of Dorothy Parker, I would have considered a very long time ago uh, bringing her back to life as a character in one of my books. But that's not really the way it happened. You know, I was, uh, I was knee deep in another, um, in another book that I was working on uh, when I got the inspiration for Farewell, Dorothy Parker. I was looking at the list of popular books out there, and I noticed how many titles were devoted to uh, the wonderful writer Jane Austen. Now, I don't know if, how many of you are aware of that, but there are numerous titles that pay homage to Austen, to her work, to her life, just dozens and dozens of books. 
Do I think that's great? I absolutely do. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. I've always been a Jane Austen fan. I'm still rereading Jane Austen, as I encourage everyone to do. But I thought it was curious when I was looking at all those books that it was only Jane Austen that was getting this kind of treatment. And I thought, isn't that funny? People should do that for another of my favorite authors. Why isn't anybody doing that for someone like Dorothy Parker? And as soon as I got that idea, I knew that I had to write a book in which Dorothy Parker was a character. And I immediately got this notion. I saw her ghost coming to life in the living room of a modern woman. So that was the genesis of this story. Now, um, some authors are lucky enough to have entire ideas visited to them like a bolt from the blue. But for most of us, coming up with story ideas is a tremendous amount of work. So just because I knew that I wanted Dorothy Parker as a character, and just because I knew that I could envision her coming back to life uh, as sort of a mentor and tormentor to a modern woman, didn't mean that I understood exactly what the story was going to be about. So from there, I sort of worked backwards and had to figure out what kind of story I wanted to write. And I realized that what, I, what was very important to me is, was to have a character who could have some kind of arc. In other words, she would grow and change because of her association with Dorothy Parker. So I thought, well, what could I do? How could I make that happen? And since Dorothy Parker was such a bold person and in such an audacious wit, I thought if I came up with a character who was so painfully shy and had such terrible social phobia that she needed someone to help her come out of her shell, that that would make an interesting book. So I came up with the character of a movie critic who is able to channel Dorothy Parker when she writes, but is unable to find her own voice in her real life, and that's cost her very, very dearly. So that's basically the plot of Farewell, Dorothy Parker. And before we open up for questions, I just want to leave you with um, a Dorothy Parker poem that I think is absolutely terrific, and that is, um, it's called Comment, and it goes like this. Oh, life is a glorious cycle of song, a medley of extemporanea, and love is a thing that can never go wrong. And I am Marie of Romania. Thank you. All right, so before we open up the floor to you guys to ask questions, um, I have a couple questions. Um, what is your personal favorite period in literary history? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, just having come out of writing this Dorothy Parker book, I would have to say it's a tie between that era and the modern era. I really am a fan of contemporary literature. I read everything. Um, I read historical novels. Um, I read classics. I read American literature. I read foreign literature. Uh, but I love contemporary literature, and I love anything that was written during the jazz era. Um, from Dorothy Parker to, you know, Hemingway and, and Fitzgerald. Um, it, you know, it's had such a, a tremendous influence on current literature and, and on all of us going forward. And going off of that, do you, do you believe that writers were more revered in the 1920s? You know, I think that they were. I think part of it is that nowadays, you know, as I showed on the uh, presentation, there are so many writers. It seems very commonplace now. But I think in the 1920s, writers were really put on a pedestal. Uh, not that they ever were the um, biggest money makers in the, uh, in the entertainment field, but, um, but I think that writers were quoted and respected uh, more, probably more in the 1920s than they are now. All right, and one final question. Um, of the, all the round table writers you mentioned, Dorothy Parker seems to be the only one who really endured. Can you explain why she's still so popular today? You know, that's such a great question. I've thought about that, and I've read some of the uh, other things from the Algonquin Roundtable members, and I do note that it doesn't really endure. It doesn't crackle and sizzle as Dorothy Parker's writing still does. I do think she had a very special genius, not just for wit, which she absolutely had, but also for understanding the human heart in a way that resonated then, resonated when I was a girl, and resonates now. And 
I would say that every single thing she she's written is still as fresh and funny as it was. Her voice was brilliant. Her understanding of the human heart was brilliant. Um, her economy of words was brilliant. And, you know, she truly endures. All right. So now um, I believe we're ready to open it up to you guys to ask some questions. East Meadow, you're first. Are you ready with your question? We were just going to ask a question about from the 1920s today, the differences between the writers. And you just actually spoke about something that our residents have asked us about. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have East Northport. Are you ready with your question? Yes. Uh, do you consider a Dorothy Parker the beginning of the women's movement in the U.S.? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Dorothy Parker uh, clearly was a very, very strong woman. I mean, obviously, there was the, you know, suffragette movement that predated her popularity. But she was a very strong woman. She was a very modern woman. I think that's one of the reasons that she speaks to us so strongly today. I will tell you one other thing about Dorothy Parker that I think it's, it's quite interesting to know. Um, she really was a fighter for rights, not just for women's rights, but for all human rights in general. And I think that's critical because a lot of people think of her as this audacious wit. A lot of people think of her as very snarky. A lot of people think of her as being as a depressive with a really dark heart. But I, I always like people to know how much she cared about humanity. Not a lot of people understand. Dorothy Parker died in 1967. So she was alive to see the birth of the civil rights movement. Um, what's interesting is that she was so, she cared so passionately about the civil rights movement that even though she never met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., she left her entire estate to him when she died. So I think that speaks volumes about her personality, about who she was as a human being. And I'll just quickly tell you one other thing. Um, there was, um, uh, in the 1920s, a very famous trial. Two Italian immigrants, Sacco and Vanzetti, were put on uh, trial for murder. And it was very clear that it was a sham of a trial, and the judge was out to get them. And they were sentenced uh, for execution. And Dorothy Parker went to Boston to protest their execution. And, um, you know, she was taunted for her belief she, for, for protesting, and she was actually arrested and thrown in jail. Um, and she always said that it was one of the proudest moments of her life that, that she stood up for these men. So I think these are important things to know about her belief in human rights and how she went, her heart went a lot deeper than just being an audacious and snarky kind of wit. Okay, and Lynnbrook, are you ready with your question? Lynnbrook, are you ready? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. One of my residents wanted to know uh, personally if you like to read fiction or nonfiction. Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually a very big fiction fan. Uh, I'm reading novels constantly. You know, a lot of authors will tell you that while they're writing, they don't read at all because they're afraid it's going to influence their voice. But I'm not a believer in that. I think writers need to read. I think writers should be reading all the time. Um, and I don't think you wind up picking up anything unless it's, it's relevant to you. And I don't believe in... Uh, accidental plagiarism. I think that we learn from everything that we read and it only influences us in a positive way. So the answer is fiction. I'm a big lover of novels. I read all genres of novels and I'm reading all the time. All right. Um, North Hicks, are you ready with your question? Hills. North Hills, I'm sorry. North Hills, North Hills. We're not Hicks up here in North Hills. <laughs> anyway, um, our question is, is this book biographical of Dorothy Parker, or is it only related to her literary uh, influence on literature? Yeah, well, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, it's not biographical per se, because it actually resurrects the ghost of Dorothy Parker and puts her into a modern setting. That said, I wanted to stay true to who she was, so there are facts 
uh, from her life actually woven into the story. That's not to say I didn't take a little bit of artistic license, but I wanted to, at very least, stay true to the spirit of who she was and honor her memory, and I wanted to pay responsible tribute to her. So, um, so there are facts of her life in the book, and what I tried to do was create a book that would appeal to Dorothy Parker fans as well as people who'd never even heard of her before. And that's sort of been equally rewarding hearing from readers who are big Dorothy Parker fans who wrote to say they love the book, as well as hearing from people who said they weren't familiar with her before. And after reading Farewell Dorothy Parker, wanted to run out and buy Dorothy Parker's works and read her uh, stories and poems and criticism. So that, that's been a great thrill for me. And I just, I have a question. Did you find it difficult to personify a memory of like one of your great heroes? It, it was. It was actually very difficult, even more difficult than I had anticipated it was going to be. You know, as a novelist, um, I always, there's always some amount of research involved in our books, because even though I take creative license, I like to start with a basis of knowledge, because that, that can give your work some um, verisimilitude. And the way I researched Dorothy Parker was, of course, to go back and, and reread all her, all her writings and, and to uh, reread her biographies. Um, but the most important thing was reading her essays and letters because that's where her true voice resided. And reading that um, put her, her voice in my ear like a little bug so that I was able to recapture her on paper. But her economy of words was so brilliant that... Um, it took a tremendous amount of editing, 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 and more editing to really capture her voice and hone the language down to the point where it really sounded like Dorothy Parker. Thank you. All right, and North Woodmere, are you ready with your question? Um, who do you think is the most influential novelist of all time? Ooh. Um... I can't say who I think is the most influential novelist of all time, but I can tell you that Shakespeare is, is you know, hands down the most influential writer in the English language and probably in other languages as well. I don't know anybody who's influenced absolutely every writer as much as Shakespeare has. All right. And Westbury, are you ready with your question? What is your opinion of Edith Wharton? Um, uh... I think Edith Wharton is an absolutely brilliant writer, um, does social commentary, kind of similar to, to Dorothy Parker, um, kind of similar to um, uh, Jane Austen. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. And finally, White Plains, are you ready with your question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay. Um, do you think there was more reading and writing before television came about? Um, I don't think there was more writing. I think there was absolutely more reading before television came about. I think that as, as writers, what we have to reconcile with is that we have a tremendous amount of competition now. And it's more than just television. It's the Internet. And one of the things that I explain to my writing students is how very hard they have to work at gripping the students. Because you're not just competing with leisure time and work time and TV time. You're trying to get the person to turn the page when they're thinking about checking their text messages, checking their email, updating their Facebook status, updating their Twitter status, and everything else going on in their life. So I think it's really critical, more than ever, for writers to really write um, fiction that, that grabs the reader and, and, and keeps them involved. Um, many of us writers are hopeful that now that e-readers are so prevalent and people are really accustomed to looking at screens, that it will bring the reading level back up a bit because people now have an electronic means of reading. I think it's starting to have an impact and I think we're just starting to see uh, what kind of impact uh, the e-reader revolution is going to have on us. All right, and we actually have one more. New Jersey, are you ready with your question? Your question? New Jersey, are you New ready Jersey, with your question? Does anyone have a question? No, I think we're good. Thank you. All right. Okay, and Ellen, I heard you spoke at the Algonquin um, about your book. 
Uh, yes, I spoke at the Algonquin Roundtable at the Algonquin Hotel uh, before uh, Farewell Dorothy Parker came out. Uh, it was very exciting. The Algonquin had just had been closed for renovations, had reopened, and they invited me to come and speak with uh, Marion Mead, who is an expert on Dorothy Parker, who and edited the uh, portable Dorothy Parker, the current edition, and wrote a wonderful biography of her. So that was, uh, as you can imagine, being at the Algonquin. Um, sitting where Dorothy Parker sat, addressing a crowd of readers, sitting with the Dorothy Parker expert was, um, you know, one of the, the great thrills of my life. That sounds amazing. Um, East Northport, are you ready with your question? Yes, uh, without revealing the ending, of course, of your novel, would you say in your personal experience that you think of an ending and you write accordingly or you write as it unfolds? Okay, that's an excellent question about, about writing, um, uh, about whether I uh, conceive of the ending first or, or I let it sort of unfold organically. And I'll tell you a little bit about my theory about uh, writing and about stories in general. I think that a novel is sort of a contract between the writer and the reader. And the reader expects to be taken on a journey. So as such, as a novelist, your duty is to deliver the reader to some place that feels very much like a destination. For this reason, I do know, I don't know everything that happens, I don't have every plot point outlined, but I do know where I want the story to lead. I know where I want to deliver my readers at the end of the book. Now let me also say that I think of a novel as, as two intertwined roads. One uh, road are the things that happen, the plot points, the story. The other is the arc of the main character, the ways in which the main character changes and grows. So what I think is important for, for a good book to do is to take both those things and to weave them together as tightly as possible so that by the end of the book your story has a resolution and your main character has grown and changed in some important way. And these two things should come together. So to answer your question, yes, when I start out, I'm not saying it doesn't change and I don't tweak it as I'm going along. I do know where I want the story to end when I start. Um, so I know where I'm beginning, I know where I'm uh, ending, and it's that you know, pesky middle that, that always gives me trouble as I'm, uh, as I'm writing the book. And you mentioned earlier that you teach writing. You actually teach writing here at Hofstra to adults. Um, what do you enjoy most about that? You know, that's been so tremendously rewarding. I love the fact that I teach continuing education because that means that my students are adults, they're writers, they're people who are working on their book and are very, very serious about their craft. You know, one of the things I explain to my students is that it's very easy to get intimidated by the amount of books that are self-published each year because it seems like everybody, everywhere you meet, uh, everywhere you go, you meet somebody who has written a novel and has just self-published it. The, th the sad truth is that most of those self-published novelists, I would say probably 90% of them, care more about getting the book out there and selling it than are about improving their craft and working on their writing. So the first thing I always tell my students is that before day one of the class, they are in the top 10% because they care about craft. They care about working on their book. So that's fantastic. I love working with these people. I love seeing them grow and learn as writers. I love seeing their passion. And I've met people of extraordinary talent, uh, you know, while I've been uh, teaching. And it's been tremendously rewarding uh, teaching and becoming uh, really critique partners and writing partners with these students. All right, and I think one final question. Has teaching at all affected your own writing style as you've met and talked with more writers? I think that teaching or critiquing is always going to help you improve, which is one of the reasons I encourage writers to get a writing pal and critique. There's something about the process of deconstructing somebody else's work that helps you think about writing in a different way and helps you think about your own writing in a different way. And it's sort of a mental growth process. So it's absolutely helped me. And some of the classes that I teach are workshops and I do think that that's helped my students as well. Um, so yes, it's been a rewarding uh, experience in every way I can think of. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today, Ellen. And thank you, everyone, um, for attending this webinar. And we hope to see you next time.